Welcome to the Human Design Collective Podcast, where we explore this system as a unique map of our potential, from the mundane to the mystical. Are there universal underlying mechanics which structure our life experiences? Are there rules to the game of life and how we play it? Where does our internal experience meet with certain inevitabilities set in motion at the time of our birth? Today, we're exploring these questions with Maria Matus, a professional astrologer and teacher who has been immersed in the field of astrology for almost 40 years now. She has an undergraduate degree in psychology and a master's in astrology from Kepler College, recognized by the state of Washington. Hey, this is John Cole and Amy Lee, and we're sitting here with Maria Matus. Maria is a dear friend of mine. I think we've known each other for about 15 plus years. We met in Austin back at a local astrology meeting and realized that we had some similar interest uh, in how we were working with and approaching astrology. I soon found out that Maria was a wealth and depth of knowledge and experience, and she's been something of a personal mentor to me. And so I'm really pleased to have you here today, Maria. I'm excited to be here and looking forward to a stimulating conversation because they usually turn out that way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we we were just kind of joking before we started about when Marie and I get together and talk astrology and world events, the conversations are usually pretty interesting and I often walk away wishing I had recorded some of it. So maybe we'll we'll have a bit of that today. But to start, could you just give us kind of an overview of how you came to astrology and what really grabbed you or really drew your attention into studying it? I come from a a family of mediums on my mother's side. Um, We lived in Portugal at the time and my mother had these books that were channeled supposedly by the spirit guide, my father's spirit guide which was news to him because he didn't believe in any of that stuff. But so I used to read those books. They were the only books my mom had that talked about the esoteric world, the metaphysical world. And I used to read those when I was in my teens and they talked a lot about astrology and, and I got a sense of how important it was, like how just important it was to life not just for individuals, but to life in general, because they were talking about some really big global concepts in those books and about the state of the world and all this stuff. And it just kind of, I wanted to know more about it because they didn't really go into detail about what astrology was like. And I had heard about astrology, but it was always like, you know, that kind of um, entertainment for people. It was not a serious thing the way that it was talked about in, you know, common society. Yeah, those those books, I think, were the spark that lit my interest. And then um, when I left Portugal for the first time, I went to England and I used to like to go to metaphysical bookstores. And in Portugal, there weren't that many. But in England, I found this like the mother load of all metaphysical stores. And and I just started devouring books on astrology. For some reason, that was the one thing in those books that really sparked my interest. The whole channeling stuff that my family was into that was interesting too but I was you know I had been exposed to that from early on so it wasn't new the books were talking about you but it was coming from outside of you right so like how does the cosmos know anything about me how does that actually work it's so bizarre the whole concept of it and I wanted to know that's what really like got me going was how do the planets have anything to do with me whatsoever? (laughs) Do you have clarity on that now? (laughs) (laughs) A little bit better than I did back then. I hope (laughs) otherwise I'd be a lot of wasted time. Almost all the questions that I've been asked about astrology inevitably go back to that. How does it actually work? And you know, what is the point of it all? I do have a little bit more clarity, (laughs) hopefully. Could it describe how you see things now in terms of our relationship with the planets? And is it, is it a question of influence or synchronicity or something else? Yes. All those things. (laughs) One of the, I think huge revelations to me uh, after so many years of looking into that question is 
I started looking at astrology itself, not its output, but astrology itself. Like, how do we get information from it? My, my education background is in psychology, and knowing how notoriously unreliable our self-perceptions are, I wanted to look at astrology differently, so I didn't want to look at self-perceptions, and so I didn't want to look at personality, character, that kind of thing. So I wanted to externalize astrology and look at astrology from the outside. And I think that doing it that way and looking at it that way has made astrology clearer to me because I can see that level of detail about what it is in itself and how we are basically participating in something greater than us. And I like the word participating because it gives us the idea that we are, so there is something that is relating to us and to the world in law, you know, not just to us. I mean, we always see it from our perspective, but it's, it's, it's affecting change itself. It is a system of change, ultimately. That's what I think it is. It's a system of change. If you externalize it, you can see it outside of yourself a little bit better. And so I like to look at it that way, and I like to look, to, look at the language in that, from that perspective. You mentioned language, and, and I know that that's been a big orienting factor in, in your work with astrology and your practice, being uh, multilingual, having a, a deep understanding of language, but then look, seeing something similar in astrology, seeing that there, it's not just random planetary elements, you know, that, that happen to be floating around influencing us, but that there is kind of a structure to it. And it seems to be a linguistic structure to yeah, I, I don't know if I would say it's a linguistic structure, but at least that model or that uh, linguistic paradigm allows you an entrance point into it. Like, you know, if we look at nature, we don't say nature is chemistry, but chemistry is a set of tools that allows you an entrance into nature and to perceive it in a particular way. And language is the same thing. I go back to this Greek word, logos, which has to do with language it has to do with word but it also has to do with mind and reason and intelligence and structure the language is tapping in is that intelligence that structure that logic and my insights into this do have a lot to do with greek philosophical thought because just because i was exposed to that in my degree early on at kepler and it is a good theoretical framework that was already there in place and that was there from the beginning. So it does allow me entrance into understanding the logos of it because language, the, the word logos does mean word and it does mean reason and thought. And so the whole, you know, Heraclitus was the first one who talked about it in this, it talk, not about astrology, but who talked about this world mind that he termed logos. That's where the word originates. Um, and so that language is just, a really good framework for understanding astrology because it taps into whatever structure is there. And there is a structure, just like there's structure to all languages. And that ultimately ties back to mind, our mind and a mind that's outside of us, that's greater than us. And I think that's the link between the below and above, you know, the hermetic dictum as above, so below. That is the link is this, is the similarity that we have, that we both have a, a mind, a consciousness. It's this reasoning faculty that is both in the world outside of us, but also within us. Reasoning meaning that there's a certain logic to it or pattern or structure? Yes, there is a, there is a, you can, um, I don't know if you've ever, read any Chomsky where when he talks about linguistics and he talks about little kids how they're born knowing grammar without even studying it I mean when you're when you learn a language you just automatically figure out the patterns of you don't need a teacher telling you grammar by the time you get to grammar school you learn it formally but you've already got the patterns of the language figured out that's the thing I'm talking about that's the logos we have an inherent reasoning faculty that allows us to see patterns. That ability to see patterns is what structures the world. It allows us to see it, but it's also there in nature. Patterns are all over nature. 
you know how the mathematicians and physicians will say it's mathematical and mathematics is another set of tools to tap into that mm -hmm. uh, chemistry is biology is astrology is it's just another set of tools that allows entrance into that logical framework that exists could you tell us a little bit how you're seeing that in with astrology with say the planets the houses the signs and how the, the structure that you're seeing there and the relationships i know this is a big <laughs> topic to jump yeah. into but <laughs> yeah so i approach it linguistically just because i'm comfortable with that so i when i look at a chart so there, there's the researcher me and then there's the me that does the actual reading of the chart. You can think of it as, um, I think this is a great analogy, is data and intelligent information systems, like uh, programming. You know, programmers are, it's a good analogy because the programmer will look at the source code, right, and try to figure out what the source code is doing. That's me as the researcher. I'm looking at the language, trying to extract the patterns, trying to reverse engineer the language, basically, from its output, which is, you know, whatever the program that is designed puts out. So if it's a game, let's say our consultations are looking at the game itself. How do you navigate this game, right? Let's call it a game. <laughs> so, so we don't call it a matrix. <laughs> um, we're participating in it, right? So there's this intelligent design out there and we're participating in it. And I'm, as a researcher, looking at the source code to figure out how the output and how we can navigate it better so that we know, okay, how is this output put together? How, how, what comes out of it? How do I influence the output as a player? How am I going to play this game in the best way that I know how? And so when I look at the language, when I look at charts as a researcher, I'm doing something completely different than what I'm doing as a, as a practitioner. And I do a lot more of that now, actually, more of the research than the practitioner stuff. It's just more mysterious and interesting to me. So I'm trying to reverse engineer the language. So I'm looking at the output, comparing it to what I'm seeing the variables are that are contributing to that output and trying to see the structure that repeats, just like you would in a grammar, trying to figure out the grammar of a language, right? What indicates movement? What indicates change? What indicates the things that are being changed? That's the material side of it. So I go back to this um, Aristotelian model of the world that's both form and matter. I think it's a really good model f for use in astrology and it has been used for a long time in astrology. So I'm trying to f piece together these things in terms of form and matter and the particularities of it. Why is it that the output can be so varied when the input is often really repeated? You know, you have a lot of the same things repeating and yet the output that we see the manifestations are so different. And I think that's the creative part of it. And that just like in a game, you know, you have the same source code for everyone, but everyone plays the game differently. So that's the creative part of living. Does that make sense? Analogies are great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amy, did you have something? Well, I, I have a million things now I want to, <laughs> I want to ask you. Um, that's great. <laughs> so, I have much, much, much less astrological background than the two of you do. So I'm trying to sort of translate or relate what you're saying to the human design system. And what's coming across to me is it sounds like, it sounds like you went after this study looking for how to look at these underlying in human design, what we would call mechanics of life. Like what are the underlying mechanics that are there that are logical, that are reliable? that we can look at to see how, how this all works. And that's kind of the research analysis part of it. And then I was really interested in what you were saying about externalizing, like looking at it from the external or objective point of view rather than the subjective personality experience. And I'm wondering if when you're, when you're talking about that, are you meaning that you're, you're looking at astrology as a language for these mechanics of life you're looking at events that are actually happening as a yes. way of validating that or as a way of seeing the output of that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Which doesn't necessarily say much about how each of us as individuals is going to experience those events or how we're going to interpret them or how we're going to work with them or get creative with them. 
but just looking at the facts of the mechanics and the events, is, yes. would you say that's a way to see it? Yes, and um, when I describe my work, I, I use this um, slide that has, because it's very dual in my perspective, and that just, you know, I have a lot of Gemini, and I do tend to see things <laughs> in dual <laughs> perspectives. But, um, yeah, I see things, uh, I see astrology as having an external side, that's the material side, and then there's a formal side or an internal side, and different elements speak more to one side or the other. And so, and you see that in different schools of astrology, where the older traditional astrology tends to be more external looking, uh, whereas the modern astrology tends to be more internal, which is how you describe the personality, the character, the motivations, the drives, all of that psychological mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. That is the internal stuff. And astrology is great because it gets at both. And it's the link between them that to me is the most interesting and that's the gr holy grail that I'm working f towards is to find, and I, I tend to work backwards, whereas mo more modern astrologers will tend to work from the internal out. I do it the other way. I, I, I start with the out and then work inward. I work towards the inside, toward finding out, okay, now that we've established that these symbols are related to these outer objective events, how now do those symbols relate back to us internally? Because now we have the correct symbols, we have the correct outer world manifestation, and we can now begin to see internally how does it relate to us, our drives, and our place in that external experience, mm -hmm. which is something that is harder to do from the inside out. Because from the inside out, you have multiple instantiations and possibilities of what can occur. So you don't know which one relates back to a particular symbol. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, a Saturn transit, and you can have a multiple ways in which that can manifest externally. But if you start from the external event itself, there's only one way back in. It's through that symbol. Mm -hmm. So you already have that particular event. You work backwards, and now you know, okay, this is a Saturn event. It's tied to this particular configuration in the chart. Now I can see the exact outward manifestation of that event, and now I can be begin to relate it back to how I participate in it. I mean, it sounds in a way like you're pointing to something that we talk a lot about in human design, and I don't, I'm curious about how you see this, where I think the way a lot of us are oriented to life is to think that we should go at it from me. What is my experience or who am I or what do I want to experience and we sort of go after life that way. But the way you're describing it, I think also the way human design is described is that that's actually not the way to go about it. You want to actually start with the sort of mechanical laws of the universe and of life and see the reality on some level, the mechanical reality of what you're dealing with. And once you see that, then that can inform how you're actually interpreting your own experiences and what you do with them. Um, and maybe it shows us something about our nature. Maybe it shows us something about what's in, inevitable in some way or already there for us in some way. So there's something in it that to me feels like starting from the acceptance of the nature that's already there. Yes. And then dealing with reality on that level in, mm -hmm. in some way rather yeah. than a confused inner interpretation of, of what's happening. Yes, absolutely. And I, I didn't realize that that's how it was approached in human design as well. And mm -hmm. I really like that because it's more grounded. Mm -hmm. it, it, and, and it connects us much better to the world around us, I think. And actually, that's one of the things about astrology that I think has been um, overemphasized is the me aspect of it. It's hard to see our connection to the world when we're so focused upon us. Um, we're, we're so focused upon our own individuality, our, our neurosis, our psychoses, our personalities, whatever. It makes it harder to see how we fit into a larger perspective, a larger framework. And actually, astrology, which is interesting because if you look at the history of astrology, it had 2,000 years of, it, it arose, it, it was invented or implemented, if you want, I wouldn't say discovered, but it, it was, I would say, invented in order to address the outer world, in order to address our place, our navigation in the outer world. And I don't advocate going back to that 
on the same level because I think we've evolved from there. And I think the perspective that we have now about the, about the understanding that astrology addresses both the inner world and the outer world is a huge leap forward because now we can start connecting them. And that's the part that I think needs to be done, but we can't connect something unless we also address the fact that there's something out there as well. <laughs> so, so that, that's to me the, the more interesting part of astrology. It's also one of the reasons I focus more on the research now and not so much on doing consultation work because there's so much that needs to be done in the in the that realm, in the realm of connecting the inner and the outer that hasn't been done mm -hmm. that I want to do. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other people doing the consultation and the personal, which is which is important as well because ultimately that's what you want. You want to grow as a species mm -hmm. and you need to understand yourself to be able to understand the world around you. But you also have to understand the world around you and how it relates back to you. Otherwise, our planet's doomed. I think that's kind of a problem that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the criticisms that I sometimes hear leveled at astrology or one of the problems that I've also personally seen in astrology is the subjective nature of, of interpretation where we can take something like this kind of like you were saying earlier and interpret it so many different ways. Like we see a, a Saturn transit and then we just, we start either looking for examples of it that in our life that, okay, well, it's probably this or it could be that. And it sounds like some of the work that you've been doing from that kind of that outside working in and that deconstruction in order to understand like what are the patterns and the fundamental mechanics or laws that are operating here can help address them. you have a, have an example of something that's manifesting and it's something that's a little bit more concrete less subjective it's not about an inner state for example and then be able to kind of either refine that or to be able to kind of isolate well th these were the important components of, of this interaction or this piece um, do you know what I'm kind of getting at here yeah it's, Yes, uh, yes, and in order to do, and we're lucky that we have the vocabulary in place to do that, because if we didn't have that starting point, we have the, vo and what I mean by vocabulary is um, the content associated with the symbols. You know, we know the words associated with these planets, with the signs, with the uh, houses, to a lot of to some those three large components and I don't want to get too technical about astrology but just we know the voc the meaning let's say what I what I call vocabulary is the meaning we know what those things symbolize in a general sense so that's a good starting point because otherwise we wouldn't be able to start connecting the out, outside events to anything if we didn't have that vocabulary so that's been in place for thousands of years so that's the starting point the part we don't have is what you're is what I think you're talking about is that what I've been talking about it's the structure how those things put are, are placed together they're not random and you know there's in astrology this is one of my pet peeves is um, we put them together randomly we kind of <laughs> throw them in and we blend them like we're making paint <laughs> and um, and I think it's problematic because we can't say anything if we do that that is reliable or consistent it, we're all over the place because this person is putting this color together with that color and saying it's you know magenta and then that person is saying no it's uh, turquoise <laughs> and it's it's just all over the place and it and it makes the profession a little unreliable in my opinion so you can do that more easily when you're doing internal stuff when you're doing internal work because internally the meaning is usually the same for everyone. The planets are pretty uh, well established and the internal work usually relies on the planets and nothing more. So all the other stuff, all the other stuff in the chart is external. It's all about the outside framework. The planets are the stuff that we identify with inter most internally. They're the essence, the pure essence. And so it's easy to do psychological astrology or character-based astrology if all you're doing is talking about these static qualities. And they are static, uh, which makes it hard to make astrology something that's relevant throughout the life if it's static. Because, 
um, I mean, we have, and I'm talking about the birth chart, not about the changing planetary movements. That's not static. But the birth chart is static. And I, one of the things that I rail against is the idea that the chart is within us, that we carry the chart in us somehow, mm. in our DNA, or, you know, that, that it's somehow internal to us. I don't think the chart is internal to us. I think the chart is like, well, let's go back to um, the game analogy, which I think is a good one. When you're born, you're born into a moment in time, right? This is transits going on. It's no different than the transits at any other time of your life. But this happens to be the one that's when you're born. So you imprint on it somehow. Somehow, it may be in our biology, I don't know exactly how that happens, but we imprint on this external reality that occurs at the moment of birth. The analogy I like is the, you know, when you enter a game and you create a profile and you create your avatar, mm -hmm. that to me is like the birth chart. The birth chart is like your avatar that you are embodying during that game, during that lifetime, this is your avatar. But it's not you, the person playing the game. It's the persona that is created at the time that you enter the game. It's the identifier, right? And the problem is when we identify too much with it, we are participating in that moment and it becomes our persona, so to speak, or a profile or avatar, whatever you want to call it. But it's not you, the player. You, the player, control the game. You're not the persona, but you are identifying with the persona a little too much when you think you need to do everything like your persona says. So this goes back to what is the chart? Are we supposed to do everything the chart is indicating? Then that would be like never evolving over time. You're just statically supposed to be what you were when you were born, that moment in time that you're identifying with. No, that moment in time allows you to navigate the rest of your life, but I don't think it's meant to be what you're supposed to, you know, like, you know, I get a lot, I used to get a lot of clients who were, what am I supposed to do? What should I do? You know, like there's no, there's no personal choice in the matter. Like somehow there's a right path and the right path is in your birth chart from the moment you were born. Do you know what I'm saying? Is yeah. This, yeah. And, wow, there's so much to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> there's like three we or four, four hours now. <laughs> all relate to some of the ways we've been working with human design. And uh, yeah, I have a feeling you guys work with it in a similar way. Yeah, there's some interesting correlations and overlapping. Amy, did you want to jump in or? It was very interesting to me the way you said that the birth chart is almost like a snapshot or something of our imprint on the universe or something. In human design, the way it tends to be phrased is almost like the moment of our birth shows how we, our, our forms, our bodies are imprinted by the cosmos. That it's saying this is, this is showing the imprint of the cosmos on our form. I love what you're saying about the difference between that in human design, we would say that's just showing us the characteristics and the mechanics of the body, but it's not saying anything about who you really are. In some ways we could say it's showing what you are. It's showing the characteristics you're dealing with based on the moment you arrived, but it's not saying anything about who you actually are, who, who can actually, how could anything actually name that you know the who of what we are exactly um, yeah, yeah. So. and to be fair to that approach there is uh something you know, this goes back to heraclitus and you touched upon that who we are how can you know exactly who you are because who you are cannot be distilled into an identity and so while we're on this earth the only way to know who we are as the player is to take on that body or that avatar or whatever, that persona that you allows you to see something else having the agency. You know, I don't want to call it soul, but some people, whatever you want to call it, but something that pre-exists before the, mm -hmm. the actual physical entity yes. exists. And so it's sort of like you can't know one without the other. You can't know the thing that is not the self 
without you can't know the self without knowing the not self and this is a very higher heraclitian statement but you know there's always opposites at play here in order to know one thing you have to know its opposite and in order to know this avatar you need this other thing that's driving the avatar that is bigger than the avatar mm -hmm. um so i totally understand why that is and it's in and why it evolved into birth astrology because it was not that for 2000 years i can understand why it went in that direction because there was a need to go in that direction to understand the larger system perhaps i don't know it's complicated mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> we're, we're, the, we're we're limited by our by our physical um existence mm -hmm. yeah it is. It's a, it's a specificity. It's a differentiation, but it's also, it is a limit. It's an inherent limitation. Yes. We, we can't physically manifest everything that's possible. We are manifesting the specific thing that we happen to be right. in, this, in this moment. Uh, there are uh, some really good books. He was not an astrologer, but he did do some work in astrology. Arthur Young, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He has, um, he wrote some books on, um, he was the inventor of the Bell helicopter, and he wrote books on metaphysics. And two of his books in particular get at this, get at this problem, but they get at the problem through conventional science. It's fascinating how he does that, but he does. He gets there through conventional science, um, and he, he gets at this problem of the limitations of the physical existence, but explains it in a way that we can understand that there's something beyond that physical existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really curious too about what you're saying about that moment of birth then is it's almost a, a problem to think that that's something static that then we're supposed to adhere to for the rest of our lives. And I can almost see or imagine, I mean, would you say then it's, it's sort of like that shows us the avatar, whatever it is, how it came into play the game, but then we're going to see this whole evolution of that through the transits as they move? Is that, is that yeah. what you're watching to actually see what is the progression or what is the, what is yeah. the flow of change? It's actually one of the things. There is another thing, which is the actual birth chart itself turning in a symbolic way. And that is much more personal. The weather, the transits that we all experience together play into that. They're sort of like the triggers but they're the triggers of a more personal journey that is also unfolding. And so that journey, um, it's all participation because ultimately you're here playing it. Um, so you're participating in, in it. it. It is not, I don't like to think of it as, um, you know, and you get into these questions of fate and free will, how much, and there's definitely, that's an important question to have because we are programmed by all these parameters let's call them parameters language we're in the code we're in the code and so we have to play by the code's rules but then there's this element just like in a game where there are these situations that arise that you have to navigate through and that navigation is choice there is that part of it that is creative there is a creative element to it i think i got off track on your original <laughs> question <laughs> but, but um there are these elements of creativity i like to call it in the in the uh in the existence even within those limitations but it's the knowing it's knowing the parameters that's the important bit i don't think we know enough about those parameters we don't know how much yeah. leeway we have and how much control we have over certain things yes. you know like in a i'm not a gamer but i keep coming back to the game mm -hmm. analogy <laughs> how much uh do we are we the elf do we deal with the magic are we you know in the gaming world are we the guy do we have to you know amass a bunch of weapons and are we that guy that right. that's just a simple analogy but yeah. we don't know those parameters very well mm -hmm. there are actually some pretty good correlations in human design with this analogy we're using as you know the, for gaming or being in a game an example might be like what's called profile. We have certain keywords uh, associated with profile. Profile meaning the line activations of the personality sun and the design sun. In other words, what line of the hexagram is being activated by that planet at the time of birth and then approximately three months before the birth. 
and that describes a certain role or character or you could maybe say a style of kind of moving through the game through through life that the person has as a point of reference um, you know like for example uh, a 6-2 profile would be the role model hermit a 2-4 would be the hermit opportunist or the 5-1 would be the heretic investigator and the way we work with that in human design is like as point of reference or a, or a checkpoint like okay the, the more we're living as ourselves, the more we're playing this role or this character, you're going to see those, those qualities expressed or be displayed in a way that it just kind of happens as a result of being oneself. So that's kind of interesting kind of connection to the game analogy. Yeah. It, 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 are those, um, because I know that in human design, there is a part of the chart that is more, the the real self and the part that is more the profile is that correct or is that There's, well that's the other thing I wanted to come back to that you had touched on is there there actually is a, a distinction being made in human design between the true self and the not self but in human design it's it's kind of speaking more about the true self who we are authentically like what or what we are as, as we were saying earlier. Like, how is our energy set into a certain pattern? How is it uh, designed to, to move through life? Um, how do we make choices, decisions in a way that is resonant with who we are versus that's the true self versus the not self, which tends to be almost like a, a non-existent alter ego that we have, where we have adopted almost like a, a false sense of self based on the influences and conditioning and, and hom the homogenization coming in from, from, you know, our families, our culture, the world. And then we respond to that by developing like these sets of kind of uh, behaviors or adaptive strategy or coping strategies. And then we begin operating from that place, but that's not really who we are. And a lot of it's usually fueled by uh, mental decision-making that mm. seems to perpetuate that a big part of human design is tapping back into our form consciousness, the intelligence in these, these forms, these bodies with the idea that these bodies were kind of designed or evolved to take us through this life, to take us through the game and help us navigate the game. But we end up just kind of not doing that. We, we override what our body's telling us. We, don't listen. We, we're running basically on mental scripts and narratives that someone else has given us. And so that's kind of the distinction between the true self and not self, as I understand it in human design. That's very interesting. So the not self is not in the chart. It's external to it. Well, you it, can both influences that you're talking about. You can you can see the not self themes and patterns in the chart, usually through the open centers and the open gates where where we tend to be most receptive to outside influences okay. and where the mind will tend to take up residence and then start trying to direct or navigate the life based on, again, some sort of mental process. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be read from the chart. Is there a correlation in the astrological tradition that... For the not self? For the not self? Um, yes, actually. Um, everything can be the not self. Everything that is external to us can be those influences that can be we can encounter the patterns that are in the chart both within and outside sometimes we embody them sometimes we project them out when we don't want to look at them or when we're not just when we don't have a lot of affinity with those patterns but there was something interesting also that you said that reminded me of something else with the with regard to the body the chart as a whole i think you know this represent the, so taking the planets out of it what's left is the landscape the terrain that's the material part right and there is a tradition in antiquity that does this where that part of the chart and it includes the houses and the signs taking the planets out that is the terrain that you're working with and that terrain has an analogy within its within the body itself so each the whole chart can be looked upon as your body and you actually have medical diagnoses that come from that there's a whole tradition of that through the signs and through the houses they occupy so that's 
that's the physical terrain. So you can even look at the chart in terms of that being more real in a sense, because that's the outer stuff. It's the material world. The planets are not. The planets are never material. They, they don't occupy the Earth. They're outside the Earth. They're something formal. They're something intelligent. They're the essences that I'm talking about that are platonic. They don't exist on Earth. But they interact with the material side of it. So it's similar. It sounds like it's similar to what you're saying in human design, that there's this physical element that has more truth to it in a sense. Because it's external. Because it's outside of our perception of it. and when we introduce the formal side, the intelligent part of it, the dynamic part of it, the planets are the dynamic intelligent part. There's a lot of confusion that comes from that. It's a, it's a very messy process, just like life. It's a messy process. And so, you know, you can think of another thing about the external part that is important is the seasonal element to it. There's a seasonal element to that sequence, the just like the, yeah, the signs, and that's external. The signs are kind of a go-between, the intelligent, formal side, and, and, in, and they are the thing that drives change because they represent the seasons. So, the, so what we're talking about is understanding the change that occurs within the external world, the material part, and how the intelligent part navigates that change, navigates those, those seasons. That's mm -hmm. fascinating. So <laughs> I have to jump in here <laughs> because, because, all right, so this, we have, we've got the signs of the zodiac as, at least in the tropical zodiac, being directly related to the seasons, mm -hmm. right? In human design, we're not using the signs directly, per se. However, they, are, they do show up in some human design charts, and they're used in the calculations of the positions of the planets in the zodiac but in human design, there is a further subdivision of the, the wheel, the man, mandala, the zodiac into one of the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching, which yes. is roughly translated to the book of change. Exactly. And referring to yes. <laughs> yes. And I was going to go there before and then it slipped my mind and then I wanted to come back to it and I forgot. That's exactly right. It, 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 I was going to mention you guys don't use the signs, but you use the hexagrams, which is the book of change. It's the yes. seasonal component of that whole system. Yes. And it plays the same role, essentially. It's fascinating that that system was developed that way because it makes total sense. It is, and it's a very dynamic system. And there's more emphasis, I think, on the dynamic aspect of it in human design than there is in astrology, which sometimes that element gets lost because we tend to see too much in astrology as static. The signs are personality rather than elements of change, the characteristics of change. And so the language gets lost the the dynamic language gets lost there a little bit yeah to take it like this to kind of finish you know sketching out the i guess the arrangement you could say if if you have the the planets which are roughly the same across both systems some of the the, the language that's used for the planets or the significations are a little bit different but they're roughly the same we've got the signs more or less being related to the hexagrams of, of the I Ching. So the obvious missing third piece are the houses, right? The houses and the houses represent the mundane, the, the mundane manifestations or areas, topics, places of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there I, I look at, I think of them as landscape, the, the terrain. Lands and so we don't have houses in human design, but we have a birth chart called the body graph. And what do we have in place of the houses? Well, we have centers, mm. which are also places. Yeah. Yes. Because the, the, the hexagrams are located in fixed positions in a center, and then you have a planet activating that position or not in the same way as that you might see aspects in an astrological chart between houses. You have aspects. They aren't called aspects, but you have relationships between planetary activations from center to center, which then are defined as channels. And so you, you see that there's a, yeah. a roughly similar organization, even though yeah. it, it's, it's different. But we're, yeah. when we look at the body graph, we're not really looking at 
well, I was going to say we're not looking at the world. We there there's a way to look at the the world through the body graph, which is really amazing. But when the the primary use of it is we're looking at the energetic patterns of the individual, the underlying patterns or mechanics that that we're imprinted with at the time of birth and the three months before the birth. Right. And this gets back to the whole language element of this because the similarities you're seeing are part of this logos that I'm talking about. The fact that you have two systems, and you can probably extrapolate that to other systems that address the, the change, if you want, and material change or psychological change. You have to have, if you have a language that addresses the same thing, you need those components. You need a component that's dynamic. You need a component that addresses the thing that's being changed, the, the object. In, in language, it would be the verbs and the objects, right? And you have to have language that addresses the origin of the change, which in, you know, in grammar, it would be the subject. In astrology, it is uh, the planets that move. They embody certain people. They have a certain dynamic. Uh, they embody the subject. I don't want to get into the whole grammar of it, but there, there have to be these elements in order to, because that's the basic structure of how to understand the process of change, is there has to be those, ele those three elements have to be there. Someone to do the action, and the action itself, and then the thing being acted upon. Those are the basic triad of all change. And Aristotle talks about this in his philosophy. It's, uh, so these languages that are useful in accounting for evolution and change you know, Aristotle calls his book physics, but it's not about physics. <laughs> it's about metaphysics, really, because it's all about mental understand, a mental understanding of the world in this way. It's almost linguistic. I mean, his whole philosophy is linguistic because he goes back to the words being used and how the logic is inherent in the definitions and the meanings of the words. So we're always back to this idea of words um, and this idea of these elements being present in all lang language. I call, you know, human design is a language system as well. Mm -hmm. And so is astrology and so are, and so is mathematics and so is all these symbol systems. They're all language systems. They're symbols, so they're language systems. But if they're good ones, they have these three elements to them. I toy with tarot sometimes and <laughs> I, I say to myself, you know, when I'm retired, I'll have to figure out the language of tarot too because I'm, I'm sure there's a structure there. <laughs> <laughs> this is like I don't know no time for that <laughs> as you were just sharing that it kind of brought to mind the professional training the PTL training that Amy and I went through in the analyst path to become certified as, as analyst in human design and a big part of that uh, that training was called keynoting where you're basically there's there's a, a very or I would say a relatively precise way of taking the the language of human design and, and they refer to like the keynotes of say a channel or a planet or a, a gate or a line and then synthesizing those into a coherent sentence that is both relevant to what's what's being looked at but then can be understood by the client but a lot of the training was around memorizing and getting comfortable with those words with those keynotes and it was emphasized that they were very they were specifically used for a reason and I've gone through a couple exercises in my own kind of study and practice of going back and doing what you're describing in astrology is deconstructing let's say the channel names for example why is this channel named the way it is why did why did Ra the, the person who transmitted human design to the world why did he call this channel a particular name or word? And what I saw was it, it was a combination of all of those things. It was a combination of the two centers that it's connecting, the two wow. gates that comprise it. He had encapsulated that into a one word that could then be used. And then from there, you, you know, you can, once that's internalized and you're working with a, you know, with a client or you're someone sitting across from you, there's kind of this art of, you know, synthesis or being able to work within the context with the person who, again, who's sitting across from you and then make it meaningful to them or find out how that's meaningful in the context of their experience. But anyway, the, the, the language part is, is what I'm really drawing attention to, which is being, it, 
somewhat disciplined about how we're using these words and not just letting anything be anything, you know, which right. is pretty slippery slope in, in, in any system to yeah. approach yeah. it that way. Yeah, it's a big problem in astrology, I think. And it's the reason why I started doing this work because there was a gap there. I mean, I didn't, there, there are people doing a lot of great work in astrology, but I didn't find a lot on the structure of the language itself other than what we've been handed down through antiquity, which there is a lot there in antiquity that's structured, but not enough. So I wanted to go beyond that. Yeah, to me, it just felt like a natural fit. As you're looking at the research that you're doing now, what is it that you're, I don't know if it's too technical to be able to describe to sort of yeah. <laughs> general people, but what is it that you're really after? I mean, one piece that's really grabbed me about what you're talking about is that it seems like this analogy of being in the game it's like we've got certain code to work with we've got certain mechanics and certain rules to deal with and then within that there is a certain amount of creativity or agency is that a, a big part of what's related to the research that you're doing yes you, you've gone you're good you listen well you've gone exactly to the thing that um i'm trying to figure out is um so yeah there are all these rules and even just defining the rules more properly is, is a large part of the work because once you know the rules, you know the parameters and you know what's outside the parameters. So what's outside the parameters are the creative part, the part that's not being structured in the, in the system of coding. Um, it's the part that you contribute, your input as the player. It's the part you bring to the game. That's what I'm trying to find, and this is a way to say it not technically. But yeah, within that, to be more specific, there are specific elements of that that go back to different techniques. So which part, and then inevitably it goes back to how the, the structures that I've already, I have to rely on the structures, I'm building upon what I've already found, which are the elements that are external to us, the elements that are internal to us, mm -hmm. how much of the internal stuff gets externalized, and mm -hmm. do we have control over that externalization? Do we have a say in that? Yeah, I think we do. So it's kind of like you're given a set of options. You're playing the game and you know, okay, you're going to be going into this particular room, and you're going to find X, Y, and Z in this particular room, but then in that particular room, you have options that aren't coded, right? You have options that comes from your own ingenuity, your own creativity. Yes. So those are the things that I'm looking for. I see. So you may not be able to control whether or not you go into that room. It right. might be that that's the law. You're going to go into that room. <laughs> and there are going to be those things there that yeah. you're going to have to accept that right. if, if you're going to deal with reality. <laughs> right. that's, um, that's the weather and that's the landscape that you're right. given. But and then, then what you do with it, we don't know. You might be able to come up with some way of working with what's there that no one's ever seen before or that right. Right. someone right. else wouldn't have been able to come up with. Exactly. Uh, to put it very simply, uh, like the seasons, you know, you're going to have winter. It's going to come. If you're familiar with winter, if you have a lot of exposure to winter, and this is a very, you know, simple way of saying something very technical. But if you're used to winter and you have a lot of familiarity with winter, you have more options because you're skilled at it. You've had experience with it. You have that familiarity. We tend to go in the direction of our f familiarity, which is why we identify with our birth chart. Uh, we tend to go in that direction, but we, have, we can have options that we might not have considered before. And so being exposed to as much of the programming as there is, gives you, uh, makes you more equipped to deal with different situations and to have more options, yes. I think. Yes. I love the way you're putting that because it seems like maybe particularly in the way that a, a lot of modern popular Western culture orients now, I think some of the ways people tend to behave can almost be like, I'm walking into this room. That's the reality. 
but I'm just going to pretend it's a different room. Like it's, it's winter, but I'm just going to pretend it's summer. I'm going to act as if, and then I'm going to make up a bunch of stuff. And then I'm going to get really confused when things right. don't make sense and everything's a huge mess. Yeah. And I feel like what you're pointing to is to say, see the laws that you're working with Absolutely. and then get really familiar with it. And you're going to become really a, adept and maybe skilled with the nuances of it so that you can be creative with it and find new ways of experiencing with it, you know, experiencing it or doing something with it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. When we identify too much with our charts as inside of us, it limits us in a lot of ways and it doesn't allow us to see other possibilities that may be. In, and then I think that's what living is about. That's what, otherwise, why would we have to experience a whole lifetime after birth? Right. 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 Yeah. I'm thinking of this fun game analogy that we, that we keep using and like walking into that room, you said we kind of go towards the familiar, for example, or we had, we're identifying with certain traits or aspects of ourselves. And you can imagine like if you're a game programmer, the character's going to go through that room, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way into the next level. Mm -hmm. But when you get into that room, there's a whole bunch of different options and there's clues yeah. in there and there's things you can go and open that safe or not. You may have missed that safe or you may go pick up the, the food in the corner or not. It's almost like there is this element of, like you said, the person, the choice of the person who is playing the game that seems to be almost required for it to be an interesting game. You know, if you think yeah. about game theory, for example, it would be very boring if you just, all you do is just w every time walk through this room and it's, there's no consequence of what right. you do w while you're in that room. And then the other piece of it too is like, if you were building a game, if you were designing a game or a simulation, you would probably want to throw in an element of just complete randomness yeah. as well to make it more interesting. And yeah. I don't know that that's necessarily the same thing as the individual choice. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That gets into some interesting areas to explore, but that seems to, to resonate with how I'm experiencing being in, you know, in this lifetime on this planet is that yeah. there are random ev events. There does seem to be at least in a certain context choice or at least the illusion of choice and that that's necessary to fully play this game if you're, if it's going to be a meaningful game and an interesting game. Yeah. I think the randomness is part of choice. Choice to me, when I think of choice, I think of the sun. I think of light. I, I think light is choice. And actually, in the language of astrology, you find that everywhere. For example, uh, the Babylonians called Saturn the sun of the night. And the key word that Schmidt uses for Saturn is necessity. Well, necessity is an absence of choice, which is what the Babylonians are saying Saturn is. It's the thing you have to experience where there is no choice. And it also happens to be the planet farthest from, you know, when you're looking in just with the naked eye, it is the darkest planet because it's farthest from the sun. So there's an element to it that lacks light. And that lack of light is lack of choice. So this equation between light and choice is everywhere in the literature. And it's a really good guide, actually, for a lot of technical uses of a lot of things in astrology. But getting back to your point, randomness to me is just choice that either doesn't originate with us or that originates far in time and looks random. At some point, it wasn't random. At some point, it was someone else's or something else's evolution, the, the outcome or the unfolding of something farther away or in time or in space. So either through someone else or in far away in time. It just looks random to us in the great scheme of things. There's, a, there's an article that Schmidt talked about a lot called The Law of Seriality. It actually becomes relevant with regard to viruses oddly enough, <laughs> where he's talking about the work of Paul Kammerer. Have you heard of this guy? I've heard the, I've heard the name. Probably through Schmidt stuff. Um, he uh, talked about uh, coincidences and what they are. He studied coincidences and like did what I'm doing with the language of astrology. He did with coincidences and tried to understand them at their nature, their composition, all sorts of things. And what he's saying, what he was saying about coincidences is that it's kind of like what 
that doctor was saying about viruses, the new uh, thinking on viruses is that they're part of uh, DNA, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. RNA strands. They're parts of decaying DNA that are let go by the, by the entity. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what he's saying about coincidences. They're part of an initial event that are spread out over time, and they're broken up. So you don't know what from looking at them. You know what the you don't know what the initial event is. But every so often they meet each other. The parts that were from the same origin, right? They have a connection to each other, and they somehow run into each other randomly or by some law of affinity. I don't know, but they are part of the same original event. So in my mind, it sounds similar. You know, like there's um, there's something that originates in some choice somewhere, it's spread out into the universe and it looks random to, you know, the passer, the normal passerby, but it, it's part of a, a genesis somewhere that has brothers and sisters out there. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. And, I, and I, I am kind of making the connection towards the perceived randomness possibly coming from individuals and the choices that they make. For example, in human design, when we talk about choice, we're usually talking about decision making. Right. And there's kind of a key concept or component of the human design system, which is called inner authority. And inner authority is referring to the individual's correct decision making process that is reliable for who they are from a, from a true or authentic self point of view. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's usually in the body one of the things that said is that uh, the mind can never be an inner authority. It can be an outer authority for others in terms of us sharing our perspective or awareness or in, in a way that can be valuable for somebody else. But when it comes to navigating our own life, it's, it's the body, the vehicle that's actually designed to do that. And that's inner authority. So we talk about, for example, having an emotional authority, which means that you have the patience to wait to clarity, to, to come to a decision that decision making is a process that happens through time and through a cycle of emotions, for example, or uh, my authority, which is, is will based or it's the heart ego center. And it's, it's about like, well, what do I want and what do I have the will for? What can I commit to? And that, that's something that happens without a lot of mental awareness. It's just mm -hmm. like, it feels almost like getting pulled into yeah. something. Anyway, that bring it kind of back to what we were talking about when we look at something like the, the, the weather or the transit program, one of the things that I saw a lot of in astrology and, and still do is astrologers essentially taking the transits as an event that is just going to happen, or this is just the way it is. Like if I've got, let's say Uranus entering my fourth house, for example, well, I'm going to move, <laughs> you know, I, it's, that's just, I, I need to move or I'm going to move, that may or may not be true. I mean, it could certainly say that the weather is, is pushing you in, in a direction of moving. Like there, there is a strong influence towards moving right now. Mm -hmm. But from the point of view of human design, at least working within the body graph, the, the point isn't to just blindly follow the transits and just do whatever, you know, Saturn or Jupiter or Uranus is doing in your chart, but to remain with following your strategy and your inner authority, your own internal decision-making process, that's a more reliable guide or indication of whether you move or, yet, or move or not. In other words, there isn't like a complete inevitability in terms of what we're seeing in the weather in, in the transit influences that are coming in. If the person has another point of reference, something within themselves that they can then make a decision from that's not, totally based on the influences. And that may seem like a, uh, a disruption in the program on some level. I'm not sure if, if it's a disruption or if it's built into the pro. A lot of times I think well, this is part of the lack of knowledge of the code. So when you have a transit and you think it's inevitable and something will come out of it, well, Let's say, let's say Uranus in your fourth, like you said, there are a lot of possible, what you're feeling internally 
is Uranus. You're, you're feeling that planet. You're going to act that planet. You're going to have some kind of action that's relevant to that planet, related to that planet's significations. But there's a whole terrain around that planet that hasn't been analyzed at all. It hasn't been looked at. It, it hasn't been, and that's just because we don't understand the code very well. Number one, understanding the code is necessary to know even if it's inevitable or not. And two, having understood the code, I don't think it's inevitable because even when you understand the code, built into the code are options. So built into, like, let's say the Uranus is, is a liberating change. And the planets are not concrete events. They're just types of change, just like the hexagram, right? It's a type of change. So the planet comes and you have a dynamic pull towards liberation. But then the sign and the terrain tells you what is motivating that. Why do you have that pull? Why do you feel this? And then that why is controlled by some other thing out there. Maybe it's because um, you lost your job and you need to move or you need the finances in your house to move or you need something else, right? Something else is compelling you to move. But in a different chart, there may be other reasons why you're compelled to liberate. Maybe you have a domestic situation that's not very liberating, right? That That's kind of oppressive and you need, you so say that that whole terrain around that impetus to liberate has to be looked at and it's often not. We just fall back on our standards. Okay, this planet has shown to correlate with moves in, it's a, it's a probabilistic statement in like 20% or 50% of the time. In our heads, we're making the calculation. We don't really know the statistics at all, but we're making it up. Oh, and you know, the majority of the times I've seen in my experience, this means a move. So that's that part of it. But now getting back to this larger question of, is it part of the game? Is it uh, violating the system? I don't know if it's violating the system as much as seeing the options in the system that maybe hadn't been seen. And maybe that inner authority that you're talking about, are there differences in the types of inner authority? There are, right? I think oh, yeah. I've, I remember that. Yeah. So the, those different types are giving you different options within the choices that you have, right? And so... In, in human design, does the planet, is it inevitable that something will happen with that planet? Or can it just go by and you feel it internally and then nothing happens? Yes, yes the latter. Yeah, because that's the same in astrology. Um, we have a lot of, you know, and this, this is just lack of um, experience from a lot of astrologers. There are a lot of astrologers, they see a heavy planet come through and they're automatically thinking, something's going to shake up my life big time. And then it comes and then it's like, well, nothing changed. I felt it inside. I actually felt it. I considered changes. I went through the mental exercise of it, but nothing actually changed on the outside. And that happens a lot with a lot of transits. That's why the transits are not reliable indicators of the evolution of your life. We use the turning of the chart into the seasons as a more, I use that as a more reliable indicator. Some people just use the transits and while they are definitely things to look at because they do influence our choices, they're not the whole story in and of themselves. But the larger question that you're asking, is it bucking, the, that's still open for debate. And the level of choice actually also depends on the person, I think. And this has to do with light. It has to do with the ability to see because light essentially is, that's what it is. The ability to see and consider options because I'm thinking of people who, you know, life just beats them down. And it's not because their chart is worse than other people's charts. It's because their, their ability to see other options and consider them is more restricted. And I think that transcends the chart. I think that is a part of something. I'm not sure if it transcends the chart. To be honest, it may be there and I just don't know where it is. But I do think it has something to do with light and an experience of, of the capacity to shine light on certain situations. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's like going back to the analogy of light and dark. With the light of the sun, it brings the greater ability to see. 
to, mm-hmm. to see the options or to have awareness of what's happening, what's, right. what, what's possible right. or what's out there, reality as it is even. Where in the dark, the Saturn thing, the, the necessity, it may be that there, this is all that it is and it can never yeah. be different and I just have to do this because I have no yeah. options, I have no choice. Yeah. It's like the opposite of the awareness, the light, the seeing. Yeah, we have it in our language. I mean, we say it all the I'm in the dark about this. I have no clue, right? I mean, it's baked into our language even. It's there for a reason. I don't think it's random. It's just a matter of finding out where that element of choice. I mean, we know it's tied to light in the sun and the moon. The question is how much of it is there in the chart and how much of it is there outside of the chart. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's hard for me to say to someone, well, you're never going to have any creativity in your life because you don't see any options because you have no light in your chart. I don't think that makes sense because, that, you know, there has to be the person has to be here for a reason. They have to be here to see those options, right? To be able to, it may be they have more difficulty seeing that and that you know, impairs their, their evolution, their choices. Is it awareness? Is that? Yeah, it's awareness. It's, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Awareness, awareness contributes to the ability to see other choices. The ability to see, light, hence light, comes from the light. The ability to see comes from there being more light. And so the more awareness you have, the more choices you have. So that's another thing to look at in the chart and see it, where exactly is that and how much of it is there. You know, the birth chart changes over time. It evolves. It turns. So people are not static. They're not, oh, it's not in my birth chart. Therefore, I'm never going to see the light. <laughs> yeah, that, there's, there's room for growth, hopefully. Mm-hmm. There's another piece of this which I wanted to touch on, and it's uh, the nodes, the lunar nodes. Mm-hmm. In human design, the nodes represent, and I know there's some there's some overlapping with astrology here, but it represents more or less the the path that we're on life, on in life, the road, or as it's sometimes referred to, kind of the stage of life, it has a lot to do with environment and then what we see in this in our environment, what we end up focusing on or being attuned to, and there is a general movement from the south node in the first half of the life moving to the north node in the second half of the life, which I've seen some interesting correlations with in various astrology systems. And then there's the, I guess you would call it a karmic piece of associated with the nodes in that being on a certain trajectory in life or a certain kind of movement through life, like a, they, they sometimes use the word fractal. This is the pattern of, of movement of the life. And you can kind of think about this from a point of view of say the rotation of the earth, the rotation of the movement of the solar system of the galaxy. And then the individual starting at coming into the world at a certain point, And you, there literally is a movement through time and space. That's in a way symbolically is represented by the nodes in the chart. And so I was kind of wondering from, your experience working with different astrological systems and looking at the history of astrology, how are you approaching the nodes and and do you see any correlations there with the common understanding of the nodes in astrology? Historically, um, there are different thoughts on the nodes and depending on what system you're used to, I just do everything empirically. So I tend to just work with the outer first. And so When I've seen the nodes in outer work, they tend to be involved in events because I'm looking at events. So what I notice is that there's an element to the nodes that have to do with connections. And now astronomically, and this plays into my understanding of it too, astronomically, uh, they're points in space. So they don't have an internal, they're not like the planets, they don't have an internal inner movement, but they are points of connection, and they're points specifically where sun and moon come together at the eclipses. So there is something very powerful about those points, but there's also something connective about them. And because they're connected to the sun and moon crossing at that intersection, 
and also they are the lunar nodes that we use. So primarily it's the lunar cycle we're talking about, but it's where the lunar cycle meets the solar cycle. I've come to see that the uh, interpretation that resonates most with that is the Uranian school, mm -hmm. which has to do with the meeting of people. But I would extend that from what I've seen in events, I would extend it uh, even farther than just people to the consolidation of energy through the north node and the dissipation of energy through the south node. So at the north node, things seem to coalesce and the right people seem to come together and they seem to um, stay for a long period. Like the, there's not just a passing meeting. There's something, like you said, karmic about that, that union. And at the south node, it's the uh, opposite energy is uh, dissipating of energy that tends to, and you see it with um, regard to like when the nodes come up with other planets together in the same sign. If you have, for example, a sun north node, there will be a, an important decision being made about some meeting or some person that you have a relationship with, some union of some sort. Uh, that seems to come up a lot in the events. And then on the south node, the dissipation of the coming apart of, it's almost like a Venus and Mars in a way, but bigger and more karmic and extending outside of people. Like I would include events, uh, like uh, some event that coalesces at a particular time with the North Node. And it, does that seem familiar with what you're experiencing in human design or is that very different? I think this is a very interesting concept that you're, you're bringing up. Um, Maria, about this coalescing and dissipation, I'd have to look through a bunch of charts and see if I can see that in events that I see happening for people. Do the, but, do the notes also transit in it in human design, or are they just in? They, they do, do transit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's actually in in what this is a point of research that I've been wanting to do. Where that's it's actually in the transits where I have seen the most correlation with outer events that as the as the nodes in the major cycle transits in human design that I see over and over again people coming together based on on those correlations so yeah and the coming together thing seems I, I see that for sure and and I yeah. think that is saying the same thing because I'm working with outer so much that's probably why I'm seeing that as well with mm -hmm. the events because you see it in synastry a lot they represent important unions with people and they seem to connect to important relationships that are there for some pivotal re reason. Yeah. I, I, I know we're getting toward the end of our time, but I, I did have one more question because I'm, I'm curious about your, your research process. Like how are you, how do you conduct your research? Are you, is that just through going through many charts or how yeah. do you do that? It's mostly linguistic. It does involve going through charts, but not as many as if I were doing statistical analysis on them. Because I'm working with close, as close to 100% reliability as I can, I don't need huge numbers. So I, I'll, like, let's say I look at, uh, and if I'll, I'll take one event, for example. Let's say, I don't know, an event in someone's life. Someone gets married or someone leaves a job or something. And I'll look at that event, and then I'll analyze the language itself. And then from that language, I'll see, depending on what particular hypothesis I'm looking at, I, I have a, usually a hypothesis I'm working with. Like, for example, one of the last ones that I was trying to research was, because I'm doing the seasonal work that I've written about, I wanted to find out what is the functional difference between the season that we're passing through as opposed to, and there's always comparisons going on, as opposed to the season that should be in that terrain that we're passing through. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to relate those two parts of the chart. How are they different? Because they're astronomically different. They're coming up in different ways. So what I do is I will take 20 charts of people that I know that I have in my database or even celebrities. People that I know are usually better because you need an intimate knowledge of the person's life that you don't always get with celebrities, but I'll take 20 people that I know and I will examine that particular aspect that I'm looking at, the comparison of those two seasons. And by looking at them, I'll try to extrapolate consistent differences between them. And once I have that difference, once I say, okay, this is the difference, then I'll take another 10 charts 
and then I'll say, okay, if, if this is the difference, and I should see it in these 10 charts of the ones that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so then I'll, that's the testing part. So there's the extrapolation of the meaning that I'm looking for, for that particular hypothesis, and then there's the testing of it. And mm -hmm. it's very time consuming. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but but it, because I'm trying to see that it has to occur in all 100 cases to be reliable as a language, Yes. And this is bad because I know exceptions exist in language. <laughs> but because I'm not working statistically and doing huge data sets, because that, I just don't have access to that, I need a high degree of reliability. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little geeky, but not as geeky as, as you might think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it sounds fascinating. And I, I see a strong link between astrology, the way you describe it, and the way you, it sounds like you work with it and a lot of the foundation of human design, which I think the founder of human design was also very much after looking at, looking for a, an objective foundation and something that was logical and, and that was speaking to these parameters that we're working with in, in life. So. Yeah. Um, uh, from talking to, and I, I'm not that well versed in human design. I'm, I mean, John has tried to teach me, <laughs> uh, but I, uh, and I've caught, I, and I do, you know, I know some of the terminology, I know some of the ideas, I know some of the concepts, but just from speaking with him and from his reading of my chart, I can see there's a huge amount of overlap and that it is, and over the years of having John, you know, explain to me certain stuff, I can see how, I am always skeptical in the beginning of everything, <laughs> but over time I can see how there is precision is the word that I'm looking for. There's precision to it that, I've, that I appreciate it's hard for me to really grasp something unless I can see it in more, in a lot of detail. And, yeah. and thankfully John is, is patient. <laughs> <laughs> that goes both ways, Maria. <laughs> yeah. Well, if people wanted to either seek you out, are you available for that? Or if they wanted to learn more about your teaching is. Yeah. You can get in touch with me through my website. I have a contact form on there and I have articles on there that you can read. I don't do as much client work as I used to. I still do some client work for existing, existing older clients, established clients and friends and family. I don't have a huge amount of time to take on new clients, but because I'm always doing the research, but yeah, but you can reach me. I'm always open to talking astrology to anybody who's curious. So, and, and I'm always open to helping if you're struggling with something in a chart. I have no problems helping anybody who wants to know more. Great. And what's your website? It's uh, www.linkosastrology.com. Uh, Linkosastrology.com. Linkos, L-I-N-C-O-S, astrology.com. We'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'd, we'd love to have you back again <laughs> to to dive deeper and maybe pick up some of these threads. If, yeah, like I'll have to learn more human design before <laughs> So I can speak more intelligently to it, but I'd love to come back. Sure, anytime you want to talk. It was a, it was a lot of fun, and it was it was great seeing you, John, and it was good meeting you, Amy. Yeah, I really yes, enjoyed we, it. We finally got a recording of a conversation. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for listening to the Human Design Collective podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please review us and share. For more information about us and to connect with others on this experimental journey, please visit us at humandesigncollective.com. You can also learn more by exploring our course and workshop offerings at courses.humandesigncollective.com. Music for the Human Design Collective podcast, courtesy of Role Model. For more information, see the show notes. And please stay tuned for more upcoming episodes on the same channel.